everyone, my name is Helen Kapalos. For those of you that don't know me, I've been in the media way, way too long. Um, and that's how I first met um, Nathaniel. I was a broadcaster for many years, um, and I guess um, joined the media at that time where social media, um, pretty much in, in its um, nascent stages, became really pivotal. Uh, it also became the landslide that kind of knocked out a lot of um, interesting um, competition and continues to evolve the landscape um, in media right now, uh, which is really interesting and prescient and contemporary, and not everyone gets it, but clearly you guys all do get it because you're here tonight. So tonight we're here to uh, learn about Instagram versus LinkedIn, which is a really interesting conversation to be having for many reasons. Uh, marketing versus branding, uh, content um, versus, um, I don't know, um, more, let's say, superficial um, means, whatever that challenge or debate or conversation might be, we're about to experience the two sides from two um, incredible operators in this space. And I'm lucky enough to be here to facilitate or to, to throw to those um, incredible speakers. So I'd like to welcome both of them to the stage if I can. Also, of course, feel free to use social media as liberally as possible and, um, and to promote the event and also to continue this important discussion. Right, first up, we've got Nathaniel Bibby, who won Best Use of LinkedIn at the Social Media Marketing Woo! Awards 2019. Yes, and has generated over $400 million in sales through his LinkedIn lead generation service. That's pretty damn amazing. And he's also one of the best content producers I have ever seen. So please give it up for Nathaniel. So make no mistake that this is his passion job, but we're also about to meet someone who is pretty incredible and her passion is really being, uh, is illuminating this space um, in a different arena, which is the Instagram arena. Uh, and I'm speaking, of, of course, of Brooke Vilinovich, who is a... Woo! Yes, yes, amazing. Brooke. Brooke, I saw you described today as a social media speaker, a social media trainer, Instagram specialist, and donut enthusiast. Is that all right? That's all right. You just don't look like a donut enthusiast, but I'm keen to find out a bit more. The Wow, really? Amazing. Okay, well, you're going to hear about that shortly. I love it. Um, now, Brooke has got members in 17 countries. She's trained thousands of businesses worldwide to increase their influence uh, and build brand awareness and make sales. She was awarded the top 50 small business leaders for 2019. She's also a bit of a cover girl. You might have seen the covers rolling around earlier. The cover of the Inside Small Business magazine, the Spring Edition and the cover of the Business Collection Magazine Launch Edition. And she's also regularly on Channel 9. So please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Brooke Blinovich. So, I'll lead you to this wonderful discussion. I feel like I need music. Thank you so much, Ellen. Can we grab the microphone? Yeah, I need that mic. <laughs> How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Woo! I need you to make a bit more of a response. <gasps> How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? So we, we had a pretty big turnout in Perth, didn't we, Brooke? We had a huge turnout. More than you two. Do you think Melbourne is going to be able Should to Should we tell them anything? what they said about you two? <laughs> Did anyone see my story? Basically, the U2 concert was on the same night as ours, and the sound was really shit. And all these people who'd gone to U2 instead of coming to ours were like, we should have gone to yours, the sound was shit. And I was like, yeah, you should have. Yeah. yeah. They'll learn. Yeah. So, Brooke. Yes. Do you reckon it would be helpful if we shared with everyone a bit about how you and I got started in social media? <clears throat> yes. What did you start then? Oh, all right. Oh, how did I get started in social media? Do you know what is so funny? I was like one of the last people to get Instagram out of everyone I know. But don't leave because I actually do know what I'm talking about. Um, how did I get started in social media? Are we telling the... Poor story. I wanted you to tell this poor story, yeah. Yeah. So I got real This involves poor. someone in the audience as well. I know. It? Do you know it's so weird? And she probably doesn't even realise it's her. So I had left my full-time job to go into this small business world. And long story short, it just didn't really work out. 
as I thought it was going to. So I was poor. I was literally down to my last $100. And my friend here, who's sitting in the front row, said to me, do you want to go and get our nails done? And I was like, oh, I only have $100 and it's probably like going to be $60 to get my nails done, but I can't say no. So obviously I went because like nails, food, <laughs> nails, nails obviously one. But do you remember, do you remember this? You parked in the really expensive parking <laughs> in the city. And as we were going in, I just remember thinking like, fuck, $60 for my nails. This parking is probably going to be $40. And then goes all of my money. So that's pretty much what happened. But that was a real rock bottom with perfect nails moment for me because I knew that something had to change in that moment. I had no money and my business wasn't working the way that I wanted it to. So that was the moment where I really decided I'm just going to put myself out there. I'm going to find networking events to go to and if there's more people that I can meet, then hopefully opportunities will arise. And that's what happened. I attended a networking event. I discovered how many business owners actually didn't know what they were doing with social media. And I started teaching social media and everything changed. Yeah, I'm so glad that you told that story. Um, when I, I first met Brooke, I interviewed her for a series that I uh, do on LinkedIn called LinkedIn Heroes. Mm -hmm. And we went for the, to the pub afterwards and Brooke told me that story about how she, you know, spent her last hundred bucks on her nails and... Priorities. Parking. I had my priorities right. And I said, why the hell didn't you share that in the interview, right? Because I was embarrassed. <laughs> I was really embarrassed. Who wants to get up in front of a whole bunch of people and say I only had a hundred bucks left? And I spent it on my nails. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure that she started with that story. <laughs> so now I'm telling you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. So if, you, if I rewind seven years ago, if I was sitting where you guys are sitting, listening to these two guys tell me about Instagram and LinkedIn, I'd probably think, you know, it's, it's all right for you. You've got the experience, you've got the followers, you've got the engagement, you've got the money, you've got the resources. Um, seven years ago, I wasn't sitting in a seminar like this. I was uh, driving home from... Uh, just quitting my job, hadn't been paid in three months. And I remember uh, looking at the fuel gauge on my, on my car as I was driving home and just knowing that when it hit to empty that I wasn't gonna be able to fill it up, uh, get home, there's an eviction notice uh, on the, the mat in front of my front door. And I'm thinking, okay, um, go inside, the sun starts to go down you can't script this stuff, right? So I go to turn the lights on in my apartment because it's getting dark. No lights come on. I hadn't paid the electricity bill, right? So I did what any grown man would do. And I called my mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, Mom, I've got no money. I need some help. Um, can you lend me some money? And she just said no. And that was my, that was my rock bottom moment. Um, I connected two extension cords together and ran them down the stairwell of my apartment building into a power socket that was in the, the public area. Um, and I connected the end of those two extension cables to a desk lamp and um, under that desk lamp I wrote my business plan. Um, so, you know, what was rock bottom and was, was the most difficult time of, um, could have been the most difficult time of my life, it was one of the best days of my life. Yeah, I have to agree because you have to hit that point to really know that you've got to make a change. Mm. That sounded so corny, but it's true. Yeah, I, I get a bit like emotional just sharing that story with you all. Um, it still brings up emotion. Mm. You know, I've shared it a few times now, but um, yeah, that was emotional story. But look at where you are now. I know, I've made it. Have you? <laughs> oh, there's, a, there's a long way to go. <laughs> just beginning. Um, so I started my business the next day. I made $15,000 on my first day. Um, which was fantastic, but I still wasn't a LinkedIn specialist. Um, so I, I contacted a business coach here in Melbourne. Some of you might know David Guest, a few of you do. Um, and I said, look, you know, I'll invite my network to your event 
And at the end, you know, he thanks his sponsors, which one of them would be me, of course. And I said, instead of saying I'm an online marketing specialist, just tell everyone I'm a LinkedIn specialist this time. You know, I do some LinkedIn training. Why don't we focus on that? And after the event, I was just completely swamped with about 40%, 50% of the room just wanting to know, like, how do I know who to connect with? How do I optimize my profile? What sort of photographs shall I use? And, you know, David Guest, being a business coach, he, he came over to me and he whispered in my ear, he said, the market's telling you what it wants. And that's when I decided to specialize in LinkedIn seven years ago now. And, you know, the platform has evolved. Like I was using, at the time, there was only 200 people publishing content on LinkedIn. Richard Branson, Tony Robbins, guys like this. Um, and since then, the platform's evolved, to, you know, so we can all publish content. We, they've got video on the platform now. So it's completely changed. I was generating 100 leads a month off of LinkedIn before you could publish content. Okay, you're all probably wondering how, how you do that, right? But it's very different to Instagram, because on Instagram, if I want to connect with Brooke, I don't connect with her, I follow her. But on LinkedIn, you connect. Somebody accepts that connection request. Isn't it more appropriate if you connect with somebody to then say, what's your phone number, can I give you a call? What would you say on Instagram if I said, what's your phone number, can I give you a call? Run. <laughs> I, would, I would absolutely not. It's very creepy. Yeah, we're going to talk a bit about creepiness. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> okay. So, shall we begin with a bit of an outline of how tonight's going to look? So, there's a, there's a couple of sides to what we want to talk about. One is attention how to capture attention, then how to hold on to attention, which is building trust, and then how to turn it into profits. Those basically, that's basically the structure of tonight. And then we're gonna open the floor up to some Q&A as well while we've got some time. So talk to the audience about attention. Attention on Insta. So basically, should I stand? Are you doing that thing? So he keeps standing and sitting and standing and sitting through the whole night. You'll see that, it's weird. It makes me uncomfortable. Anyway. So attention on Instagram, it really all begins with knowing who you're targeting. So this is something that I think so many people jump on the platform and they just start posting what they think people want to see rather than who is your target market specifically. What does that one person need from you? What are their problems? How can you solve them? And how can you provide value? Which on Instagram, value is considered content that's either entertaining, inspirational, or educational. So that's basically how you're going to capture their attention. Think about who the person is, that you, whose attention you're trying to capture, and what will they find one of those three things? What will your target market find entertaining? What will your target market find inspiring? And what will your target market find educational? Start there rather than starting with, what am I gonna to post today? Think about what do they want to see today? Change your mindset and it will change the attention that you capture. Brooke, what's more important on Instagram, the image or the caption? So your image needs to draw them in and your caption needs to back it up and deliver the goods. So make sure that your images are always crystal clear. It is one of, I should write like a seven deadly sins. I might do that after. Of all of the stupid things that people do on Instagram. Instagram is a visual platform. Your visuals have to be phenomenal. Otherwise, people will keep scrolling. They won't stop. Phenomenal or fucking phenomenal? Fucking phenomenal. Is this a safe space for me to swear? Yep, I've already... Is anyone offended? Someone holds up a cross, starts throwing like holy water at me. Sometimes I have a potty now. <laughs> anyway, so you've got to make sure that your image or the video that you're sharing is absolutely crystal clear. That's number one, non-negotiable. Then your caption needs to back it up. So you need to make sure that in your caption, unlike at school, at school we got taught that you need like an opening sentence in an essay and then it developed and you added your points and then there was this big conclusion at the end. Instagram, you've got to flip it and do it the other way around. You've got to get to the point in the first sentence, in the first thing you say and hope that that has captured their attention and their interest enough to then open the rest of the caption. 
So on LinkedIn. Mm, tell us, it's very different. The caption is the first thing that people will see, right? So when you scroll through the newsfeed, you don't see the image first, you see the caption first. So most people, like they know that video is gonna go the most, most viral on LinkedIn, but what they don't do is write the caption to go with it. The reality is no one's gonna press play on your video unless the caption compels them to. So it becomes, I don't, I don't know if it's more important, it becomes like essential for them to even watch the video. On average, after the first 10 seconds of the video, 50% of the people watching it are gone. So what do most people do with the first 10 seconds of their videos? They're Waffle. Like, Hello, I'm Hello. Daniel, here I am, I'm doing a video. Oh, do you know what people do? Sorry, I, I cut yeah. him off all the time, but I need to, because this is important, more important than yours. Okay. Um, when people jump on Instagram and it's a new thing and they go, hi guys, just jumping on here today to tell you about this thing. Whoop, video's ended. Yeah. You're like, what's the thing? Yeah, 80% are gone after a minute. You know, so, like if your video's five minutes long, no one, like 20% of your audience are gone. Are not watching four minutes of it, you know? On Instagram, you've got 15 seconds. So when you open your Instagram story, Get to the point, straight away. Don't say, I'm on here to talk about this. Hi guys, just wanted to say this. Just wanted to jump on here and do this. Just do it, whatever it is. Think about Nike every time you open your Insta story. Think about Nike and just do it. Yeah. I mean, attention is changing like quicker than ever. And even if you film like a longer video, I do this with my interviews, right? You're interviewing somebody, hi, this is so-and-so, welcome, blah, blah, blah. How are you today? Like, you know, how's your day been? That all gets cut out and we go straight to the content. We edit it and cut it all out. Nobody cares. Get to the point. People's attention span on Instagram and LinkedIn, on social in general, they're scrolling and they want to see something that captures their attention. They don't want to see, hi, how are you? They want to see the point. So the sooner you can get to the point, the sooner you're going to capture their attention and keep it. And keeping it is key. Yeah. So, what... Are we sitting again? I'm going to sit for this point, just for, for <coughs> emphasis. Okay. Ooh. Who likes my orange socks, by the way? They're good, aren't they? Who likes my paper clips? Oh, yeah. I was Irish dancing before oh, we're we started. We're actually breaking the rule here. <laughs> I broke my this pants. Is, this is the thing, with, with, okay, with, with social media, right? It's all about adding value to the audience. Yes. And so, you know, LinkedIn versus Instagram is not really about which platform's better than the other. It's about where you're audience is spending their time and how you, get, how you can engage their attention on that platform to be able to influence them to make buying decisions, right? But these days, the more value that you add, the more people want to buy from you. Yep. You don't really need to do the call to action at the end anymore. Like in the old days, you would, or not, I, say, I keep saying the, the old, old days. days, like last week. <laughs> Like two years ago, like you talk about, if there's a web developer in the room or web designers, you know, you call to actions on every page. Social media is a social place for people to hang out. It, like it, they say that the, has anyone heard of the mere exposure effects in the room at all? So mere exposure effect is a psychological phenomena that basically says the more someone is exposed to your brand, the more they are likely to buy from you. And it used to be like three or four exposures would be enough for someone to trust your brand and they buy from you. These days it's more like 21 exposures. So if you think about social media, like how do I get 21 exposures in front of somebody so they trust me enough to want to buy from my brand? And you put 21 call to actions in front of them, you're just going to piss them off. It's just going to work against you. You've got to put 21 entertainment, information, what's the other one? Inspiring stuff. Entertain, inspire, educate. Yeah. Make sure it does one of those three things. Educate's a good one, yeah. Educate's like ideal for LinkedIn. Entertainment would work well, but you've got to be good because on LinkedIn there's not much entertainment happening. <laughs> but on Instagram yeah. there is, right? Yeah. On Instagram there's heaps of entertainment yeah. and there's heaps of inspiration as well. So you've got to like, firstly work out what it is that you're trying to do on the platform, what your goals are, who your audience is, and then what entertaining, inspiring or educational content they're going to find valuable. Yeah, and so if you're wondering 
Because like most people, if you, if you went home tonight and you had an honest think about the content that you're producing and you ask yourself, is it to serve my own human needs or is it to add value to others? I think most of you would probably say, well, you know, it's to add value to others, but is it really? Like you've really got to think about it. Like who is it adding value to? And if you're not sure, maybe ask your audience. Yeah, I have a trick. So before you post on the platforms, Pretend that you are sending that post as a text message to your customer. It will change everything that you do on the platform. Because when you start shaping it as a text message, which is a form of conversation, it changes your mindset into, are they going to care? Are they going to care to receive this? Or am I just talking about myself? And it really will stop you from posting a lot of irrelevant self-serving content that isn't going to capture attention. So it is a really good trick to do every time you post. And this goes for any social platform, not just Instagram. You can do that for LinkedIn as well. Yeah, I, I don't do much like straight down the barrel stuff or like selfie stuff. But when I do, I imagine there's one person there. Yeah. Like, not like I'm speaking to everyone because it, nobody's watching it in groups, right? If you're consuming content, you're normally doing it on your own. And so you want the person on the other end to be speaking to you like you're one person. And so you should really have like an avatar in your mind of one person that you're talking to. Yeah, absolutely. Good hack. Yeah, well done, me. <laughs> <laughs> trust, how do you build trust on social media? By adding value. <laughs> So there's a couple of things on Instagram. You got to show up, you got to add value, you got to stop selling. As soon as you start selling and as soon as you make it salesy, as soon as you have dollar signs in your captions, that trust is gone. You need to give behind the scenes into your business and you need to do it consistently. You need to let them see your face. You need to let them see the face of your team because People don't trust logos. People trust people, people that they know and they like and they want to support. So the sooner you can get yourself and your team on your Instagram account, if you don't feel comfortable straight away, my best tip on that is to do some professional photos. Get some professional headshots done. Get your 30, 40 headshots and start to drip feed those in your feed because that's what's gonna to start to really catapult that trust because they can see who they're supporting. They're not just supporting a logo, they're supporting a person. What about LinkedIn? Well, on LinkedIn, you can actually get, it's interesting because you can actually get away with not being as, as well polished. Mm -hmm. Like it's totally okay just to do like talk straight to the camera, but you gotta be consistent. Most people aren't consistent. They do it once or you know, a couple of times here, or they might come to an event like this and do another one. But it's consistency that builds trust. How often is consistent? Well, it just has to be the same, right? So like if you're already doing it once a week, that's cool, but just do it once a week consistently. Okay. If you're doing it every day, do it every day consistently. I'm doing it five times a day at the yeah. moment during the week. You um, must be tired. Eh. It's about confidence. Yeah. A lot of what we're talking about is about confidence because people don't post because they don't know what to post, but you learn what to post by posting. It's the chicken or the egg. So how do you get confident? How did you get confident? So I got confident on social media by, by doing it a lot. You know, competence builds confidence. It, you know, after a while of doing this, you go, okay, now I know a thing or two about a thing or two. Totally. And people always say, sorry, I cut you off again. Not sorry. That's totally cool. People always say, oh, I'm worried about what to post and what people will think. But if you've only got 10 followers, there's no one there to be worried about what they think. Exactly, yeah. And look, if it doesn't work, that's okay. But yeah. do something else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. If you put up a post and no one likes it, no one likes it. It's a shit post. That's it. Find something else. <laughs> People it's always. Okay. It doesn't mean you're a shit person. It doesn't mean you're a shit person, but it means that content is not either targeted at the right people that are following your account or valuable content. Take it down, delete it, by, share by, something else. By the way, I still post stuff that like doesn't get many likes, like two or three likes. It happens quite a lot. Yeah. 
it's totally cool. I'll just put another one up tomorrow. I don't delete it or anything. It's okay. Yeah, it's totally good. Because I'm always trying new stuff, right? Yeah, you're constantly trying. Trying and trying and trying and trying. Looking at what your industry leaders are doing and trying what they're doing and seeing if that works. And actually, 99% of the time, it does. Yeah. I, th I find Instagram quite intimidating. Is that, who's, on, who's on LinkedIn more than Instagram in the audience? Keep your hands up if you find Instagram a little bit intimidating. Am I the only one? Just, <laughs> just you. <laughs> That's all good. And what about on the flip side? Who's more active on Instagram? Put your hands up. Me? Keep your hands up if you find LinkedIn a little intimidating. I don't find it intimidating. I just feel too loud for LinkedIn. You are too loud. I am. Everything he puts up, I comment like, woo! And all these other people are like, excellent job, Nathaniel. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So t tell everyone about your um, experience in the um, private messages on LinkedIn with roses. Oh my gosh. So on Instagram, emojis are cool, right? On LinkedIn, emojis are weird. So I got this it, this DM slid into my LinkedIn DM. We don't call it DMs on LinkedIn. What do you call it? Messages. Mess private messages. Okay, so this guy slid into my private messages with like 50 rose emojis. And I sent it to Nathaniel. I'm like, what do I do? What, do I what does he want? So on LinkedIn, that definitely doesn't fly. Alternatively, if someone sent me 50 roses on Instagram, I might be interested. I'd have to check them out. Interested in what? I don't know. <laughs> Interested in learning more. Yeah. Okay. And then I'd block them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. yeah. So look, I, I'm a big believer in generating leads through LinkedIn through private messages. The more emojis you put in a private message, the more desperate you seem, the less money you'll make as a general rule. I don't want this to be misunderstood, like I'm not saying emojis are no good on LinkedIn. You can use them in captions when you post stuff. I still use them. Just don't use as many as Brooke uses on Instagram. <laughs> and you'll be safe. It's overkill. Yeah. On, on Instagram, use as many as you want. Yeah. I really don't mind. I have to, I have to give a little bit of a, a plug for Brooke here because I did join uh, Brooke's social club membership and um, I haven't been as diligent with watching the weekly webinars as some of the other members, but I watched one webinar and I got more value out of it than it would cost for me to be a member for two years. So she knows her shit, which is why she's sitting next to me. Thank you, thank you. I'll pay you for that later. <laughs> I know one or two things, yes. Maybe you should listen to more webinars and you may know some more things. 100%, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't believe there was so much that, that went into it. In fact, do you mind sharing what I learned that webinar? Yeah, so go for it. Brooke's got a strategy called the four fucking phenomenal stories. Yes, I do. That was awesome. I, I, it, I found it quite time consuming to implement for me, because mm -hmm. you've got to do these things called hashtags and location tags, and yeah. you've got to post stories every 15 minutes. And but, and but, <laughs> but it works. So this is the brilliant thing about Instagram. It either works or it doesn't. If you do everything that I tell you to do, it will work. If you don't do it, it won't. It's really that simple. So I came up with this strategy because um, a couple of months ago, so there's lots of fake accounts on Instagram, all right? You, if you didn't know this, you can buy followers, you can buy uh, likes, you can buy comments, you can buy comments from a certain country for a certain account. You can also buy story views, okay? The stories are hot right now. They're really hot. So basically, fake story views were becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and Instagram really had to get on top of it. So they started keep culling, killing culling, all of these fake story views and everyone's story views suddenly started plummeting. And so I thought, all right, I've got to come up with a strategy to really peak story views again, get your story views back up there. So has anyone noticed that lately? If you're posting to stories, the views are plummeting. All right, so this is what I want you to do. First of all, it all begins with your key times. Okay, so you need to use your insights 
in your Instagram account, you need to have switched to a business profile. You need to have over 100 followers to access this information. So you find your key day by accessing your insights under the audience column, scroll to the bottom of the screen and there is a graph, right? What you will actually see is time slots broken down into three hour blocks. There's an option to switch to days of the week instead of hours of the day. I want you to switch to the days of the week Find the block that has the deepest blue because that is the day that the majority of your followers are online. So that's your key day, right? Now in that key day, I then want you to switch to the three hour blocks and I want you to find the block that has the deepest blue. I think I skipped that bit. And you still got results? Yeah. Fuck yeah. If you had done that, you would have gotten even better results. Okay, so do that next week. So find your key posting day, your key posting time, which is a three hour block. Then I want you to create four fucking phenomenal stories. Now they have to be fucking phenomenal, all right? So you think about your target market and you think about, how much is it? A minute, a minute's worth of content that they are going to find fucking phenomenal, all right? You have your 15 second stories in your camera roll waiting to go that you know your target market is going to love. And think about if I'm about to just text them these 15 stories, are they gonna care or not? So you know that they're gonna care. And then what I want you to do is stagger the posting. So you post story number one at the start of your key time. You wait half an hour and you post story number two. Even if it's one long video that does actually join together. Then you wait half an hour, you post story number three, then you wait an hour and you post story number four because that's gonna keep pushing your content and your story to the front of the story carousel on the day and during the time that majority of your followers are active. It actually works better, yeah, like when the 15 second video doesn't make sense on its own. Yeah, because it leaves people wanting more. Because people are like, what's, what's happening next? What's, yeah. what's the point of this? They're going back, they're going forward, they're going back, they go, the engagement's peaking. Instagram keeps throwing your content to the front of the feed yeah. because people are clicking stuff. They're clicking stuff. And then I want you to add a location tag to each story and a hashtag to each story and that will ensure that your views skyrocket. Because the more views you get, the more quality content the Instagram algorithm thinks it is, and it in turn shows it to more people. So that's how you essentially reset those story views. Go away and try it and DM me 50 rose emojis and your results, because I guarantee it works. 100%. Thank you. People connect with negative content more than positive content as well. So I want to like share this hack with you, I guess. Um, I, most of us, I think the business owners in the room will want to jump on LinkedIn or Instagram and start talking about their solutions and start talking about their service. And I think it's one of the biggest mistakes you can make. What you want to do is focus on the problem that you have. Most of the people in your target audience, if they knew what the solution to their problem was, they would have solved it. So focusing on the three biggest mistakes that business owners make on Instagram. Mm -hmm. or mistake posts, mistake posts are incredible content. If you can point out mistakes that your customer is making that's not getting them the results that they want. So don't tell them these are the results. Tell them these are the mistakes that you're making and then they'll assume that you know how to get them the results. Oh, where did you learn that one? I learned, I learned that off my friend here, <laughs> but I'm taking it. But it is so true. So three common mistakes made doing X, Y, Z. People love that. That type of content goes off. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you can define the problem better than your audience can, they will automatically assume that you have a solution. Yes. Tony Robbins is fantastic at this. He's like, if you give somebody the problem in the better words than they can describe it in, they'll just assume that you have a solution. Yeah. 
you know. And so you could, you could literally write an article all about the problem, not mention anything about what you do, and you would create intrigue, and they would click on your name and read your profile. And it seems like a real subtle thing, like they've clicked on your name to read your profile, but that's in marketing what we call an inbound activity. They've asked for the information, therefore they're more likely to consume it. You, don't, you, want to, you want to avoid pushing information about what you do on the people. It's a big psychological thing, but like if you go into your LinkedIn inbox and you see all of the sales letters and recruitment letters that are in there, the reason that they don't work is because they're talking about what they do. Nobody gives a fuck. Like nobody's interested. No one, like I always say, nobody gives a fuck about your content, right? They're only interested in themselves. But the good thing is you can be guaranteed that they're interested in themselves. So if you put the focus on them and say, hey, I'm interested in learning more about what you do. I want to find out what your business objectives is. Ah, uh, let's hop on a phone call. They're like, fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to spend 15 minutes on the telephone with you talking about me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. People love talking about themselves. People are so self-serving now more than ever because of social media. Yeah, and you, you don't want to like help everyone. You only want to help people that have the problem that you solve. So the whole objective of social media is really just to start a conversation. Because if you start a conversation, you can find out if they have the problem that you solve. And if, you, if they do, then they'll naturally want to do business with you. They already like and trust you. Yeah. They'll come after you, and that's what you want. That's such a powerful position to be in, especially in business. Yeah. I think, I think there's one thing that you could take away from tonight. It literally should be on social media, in the context of social media, stop selling and start helping. People want to buy. They want to buy. They have a problem. They want to solve it. They just don't want someone to sell to them. Yeah. Should we talk about Christmas? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to change the subject, but it's not. It's on the subject of selling. Cool. Because Christmas is normally when people on social media go, all right, I'm taking a break. I've been posting all year. I've been trying this all year. I'm tired. I want to take a break. I'm just going to tap out from social media at this time of year. And I'll come back on in sort of January. It is the biggest suicidal algorithm mistake that you can make, guaranteed. Because A, well, actually there's a whole, ra a whole range of reasons here. So if you wanna get ahead of your competitors, the best time for you to post is when they stop posting. And if all your competitors are thinking about taking a break, then whose content are your customers consuming if you don't take a break? yours. This is your best time to get ahead. Also, at Christmas time, it is the only time of the year that instead of marketing to one person, as we've been talking about, you're marketing to many. Because what do you do at Christmas time? You're scrolling, you're not just thinking about yourself. You're thinking about, I need to buy a present for my mum. I need to buy a present for my dad. I need something for my sister, my co-worker, my boyfriend, my husband, my wife, girlfriend, whoever. So you're opening up that door to so much more potential market share. And if you go, you know what, I'm gonna take a break during this time. Yeah, well like no one's looking to buy presents for their girlfriend on LinkedIn. On Instagram they are. Are you? Subtle difference. Subtle difference. But on Instagram, if you take a break during this time of year and then you try and come back, Come January, good luck getting back into the news feed. Yeah. And so since I started my business, like um, consistently, December has been the best performing month for engagement on social media by as much as 30%. It's so crazy that even four years ago, I was spending a lot of time in the financial services sector and the highest engagement we got all year was on Christmas Day. It's huge because people are on their phones. They're scrolling. Your consumers are on holiday. So this is the time to capture their attention and start creating content that when they're scrolling, they're going to stop and look at. Yeah, if you want to reach like a CEO of a huge like, you know, company, like you're going to have more chance of doing it in December because they've got more time on their hands and they are actually planning for the year ahead. And so the wrong thing to do, like a lot, a lot of clients say to me, they say, 
Nathaniel, everything shuts down over Christmas. Let's just pause our campaign in December. And I'm like, no. The worst thing you can do is the worst time of the year yeah. to stop. And it is the best time of the year to get ahead. Yeah. And it's a reason that like most of your competitors are doing it. Therefore, it works. Let's talk about some of these crazy Shall we get posts. practical? Like, honestly, half of this stuff won't work on LinkedIn. But let's talk about it. So... Oh, we're going to get straight to the duck face one. Duck face. Is that what you call it? Um, nah. It's a selfie. It's a selfie. So here we have, and this is specifically Christmas post. Here we've got a selfie. This is the business owner. So she's building up trust because she's giving her business, which is a logo, a face. Right? So you immediately know who you're connecting with and who you're supporting. And she's just saying, after a huge year, beginning to finally see the holiday light at the end of the tunnel, I'm ready for some downtime with my family. Again, making her a real person. She talks about her family. It's not just a logo anymore. It makes you foster that connection. It makes it relatable because you know that if you're purchasing off her, you're supporting what's going on behind the scenes of her business. Do we think this is gonna work on LinkedIn, guys? Absolutely. <laughs> Hands up who thinks yes, it will work on LinkedIn. Boom, unanimous. Good. Good work. That won't work on LinkedIn. Do you want to tell them about your bikini shop? Yeah, so, oh, uh, no. Okay. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go on. Did this come up in Perth? It didn't yes. It? Okay, cool. Uh, yep. So I got in trouble for posting a picture of 20 women with Santa hats on and red bikinis coming out of the ocean. I thought it was appropriate for Christmas in Australia. You know, we're on the beach, we've got Christmas hats on. But um, I did offend a couple of women, so I changed the image, believe it or not. Good for you. However, since I've become on Instagram, I think it's appropriate for the platform. So you need to keep an eye out for me down the beach. Someone will be wearing a bikini. I don't know if it'll be me. With a Santa hat on. I think it will be you because that will be funny. It will be funnier, yeah. It will be funny because by the time we finish this tour, you'll have three states worth of people that will get the inside joke. Okay, I'll do it. Do it. Next. All right, next. Okay, so here we've got a shop. This is a shop in Perth, it's called Perlu. So she's got the shop owner, Sophia, here, has brought all of her team into the photo. Again, showing you who you're supporting when you buy off them at Christmas. So don't be afraid on Instagram to show your team and showcase your team in a fun and social way because that's going to once again put more faces to the logo and help build up that trust and build up that connection. Who thinks this would work on LinkedIn? Eh, creeping up. Yep, few of you. Who thinks it won't work? Few of you not sure. Yeah, I reckon it work. Yeah. Team. People like a team. They like to support a team. They like to know who the team is. Yeah, and you'll soon find out whether it does or doesn't. Like you post this stuff on LinkedIn, if it gets engagement, it has worked. Yeah. If it doesn't, post something else. Easy. Easy. Everyone's audience is different as well, right? Like so my audience on LinkedIn is completely different to who Brooks might be. Like people say to me, oh, LinkedIn, it's full of salespeople and recruiters, it's just crap. It's got nothing to do with LinkedIn, it's to do with their network. They've got a crap network. They've accepted all these connection requests from salespeople and recruiters, and they haven't been proactive about who they're connecting with, and that's why LinkedIn's crap for them. But they like to blame things outside of themselves, so they blame LinkedIn. Would you recommend going through and deleting all your connections if they're crap? Yep. Okay. What's the point of having a crap connection? Yeah. Starting again or starting a new account? We're on the, I mean, you can keep them, but just be proactive and add people that you want to create a relationship with. Right. That's why we're on there, but to build relationships. So social media, as I said, creates conversations and conversations should create relationships. If you're yeah. having the right conversations, right? Absolutely. And that's why we're on there. So don't spend all your time trying to go back and forth on LinkedIn or on Instagram chatting about what you do. Build the relationship, take the conversation offline. It's a really important step. Yep. Yep. Agreed. So you, on Instagram, you do it differently to, to LinkedIn, right? We do. Like I just asked for someone's phone number on LinkedIn. Don't do that on have Instagram. Have a meeting. Do not. 
So have yeah, you, instantly creepy. You want to talk about lead magnets quickly while we're here? Yeah, let's talk about lead magnets. So on Instagram, you want to create something. So you've got your valuable post. You want to make something that's like a super post. So it's something super valuable to your target market, which we call a lead magnet. So you could take a topic and create an ebook, turn it into a PDF. It's something that your target market are going to read. It might even be your very, very, very best content. Because the point here is, if your audience read it and they see it and it's super valuable, they think, fuck, oh, if that's what she's giving away for free or he, I can't even imagine how good her products and services are that I actually pay for. There's an important point as well, is like, you want to give all of your best stuff up front. Away. That's why we're giving you all of this tonight. We're giving you all of our best stuff. You can learn everything that Brooke and I know by following our content. Yeah. There's nothing to hide. It's just that- That's all we've done. That's how we've built our businesses. Yeah. And we still have businesses operating, running, people are still paying us money. We get, so we get paid it 10, 15 grand to go speak to a company, but they can get it all for free. It's because they, they know that we know what we're talking about. And so they'd rather just get us in to train their people yeah. than, you know, train them themselves. Yeah. Don't be afraid to give away your best ideas for free because that's the world that we live in now. That's the best way that you can build up that trust. Yeah. And most people are afraid to do it. They, want, they think they're like sheltering something valuable or something. All the information's out there. Yeah. You know. How else are they going to trust you? Mm -hmm. So you get your lead magnet. People have to give you their email address to get that lead magnet. And then you take the sale onto email marketing because that's what people expect on email. They don't like it on social media because it's social media. You don't sell to them on social media. You prove your value to them because ultimately the more that they value your free content, the more they're gonna value your product or service. That's how you do it. That's how you create sales from Instagram. Yeah, and a little trick as well, like I'll share this little hack that you can use when you are using lead magnets. It's like quite often you'd be like, oh, do you want to get my 22 step profile optimization checklist? Go to this link, fill out this form. A cool way to do it is instead of saying go to this link and fill out this form is you say comment below with checklist. And so all of those, you know, hundreds of people that would normally just go off to the link are commenting on your content Therefore, it gets a lot more engagement. Therefore, a lot more people see it. It goes viral, basically. And then you just private message them with the link. Yeah, and you do that on Instagram as well. So you can say, comment this emoji if you want this for free. And people start commenting. It increases engagement. It tells the algorithm it's quality content. The algorithm shows your content to more people. More people comment. And it creates this viral effect, this ripple effect. Then you DM them with the content, which is fostering and nurturing that relationship even further because you have taken your time to DM them and start a more private, private intimate message. combo. Yep. Private message. Just Sorry. translating. Yep. DM. Next Direct. Oh, Jen Atkin. So Jen Atkin is one of my favorite business owners in the entire world. Jen Atkin was your average at-home hairdresser. She's now the hairdresser to all of the stars. She does all of the Kardashians. She's also created her own product, all right? So even if you're not interested in hair and what she does, follow her on Instagram as an incredible example of how you build up your personal brand without selling because Jen is so good at this. I swear she nails every post. So what we've got here and what people love is a list. Now lists are super easy to engage with, especially when they're numbered. Why? Because your audience don't need to write a long comment. Your audience can look through the list, see a number that resonates with them and easily comment, oh my God, I love number two. They don't need to comment more than that. Now, as far as the Instagram algorithm is concerned, that's a comment, that's engagement. So the more you can get them to comment by making it easier to comment with something like a list is going to drive your reach and drive your engagement. Yeah, and on LinkedIn, like lists work as well, like articles with numbers in the headline do really well. 
and it gives people, like they know what to expect when they consume the content. If you just, and it's, with videos it's fantastic. Because if you let people know up front, today I'm gonna to talk about the three things not to do on LinkedIn. People love numbers. They know what to expect when they consume the content, therefore they're more likely to watch it. Do you know why? It's probably because that's the first thing we learn to do. We learn to count. We learn numbers. We trust A lot numbers. of this is to do with what, how we taught stuff in school. Now we're getting deep. We're we are getting, getting deep. That. Yeah, and this is why we're also scared to post, but anyway. <laughs> I'm going to skip a couple here because we can't, we got tight. Oh, we, we've got to do this one, haven't we? Because this definitely wouldn't work on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is what I will say. I've said you're not allowed to put dollar signs in your captions unless this is where it's an exception. If you are giving people something for free, like a discount code or you're promoting a sale, that's where you can do it, okay? Because it's not salesy. Again, it's serving them. It's giving them a discount, a promo code. It's giving them something valuable to them. So this makes it okay. Yeah, so you'd have to do this in a private message on LinkedIn for it to work. But like giving someone a promo code is giving something of value. Like if you're promoting an event that's not free, um, if you give a promotion code that gives a discount, it is something of value that you're giving to somebody. Totally. And it will work. Um, I want to talk about this because this is an example of how you, it's not selling, right? But you're talk, if you start talking about the results you produce, it's pretty much the same thing, right? Like you're, if you share with people the results that your clients have achieved, first of all, it's not about you, it's about the client. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, congratulations, we did it. They raised a million dollars in six weeks and Part of the campaign was LinkedIn capital raising. Um, that's a picture of me and the marketing guys celebrating. Afterwards, there was no alcohol below this point, by the way. <laughs> yeah. We actually were not drinking. Um, but yeah, so it's not about me. It's not saying I did this, I'm awesome, buy from me. It's about the client. The client's awesome, the clients love it. Gets loads of engagement. And guess what? A few companies that are raising capital contacted me privately and said, we would like to talk to you about how you could, you know, work with, work with us. So. You yeah. guys do that on Instagram, right? You talk about I do it on I Instagram do it a lot. as well. Yeah. So I share, basically when I started my business, I, I dropped out of uni and I dropped out of TAFE. And that was a really big fear for me that how would people listen to me thinking that I am a dropout? So I thought, well, if I take the attention off me and I just constantly share the results that my clients are getting, then hopefully my followers will be more focused on the results of my clients and they won't worry about the fact that I don't have a university degree. At the time, I didn't really realise what I was doing, but by sharing the results, I was attracting followers who wanted to achieve those results. And ultimately, they're the followers that converted into customers and still to this day continue to convert into customers because they want the results. They don't care about the product. They don't care about the service. They don't care about what it is. They care that it gets them results. So if you have a product or service that delivers constant results, share it, share that content because that is going to attract more customers and more customers you want to work with. Cool. Cool. I think we should do some Q and A. Yeah. Are you ready for that? Are you? I'm. Just, I'm going to be in thirty seconds. All right. Are we sitting down? We've got Garth coming up to the front to get one of our microphones ready. All right. You're going to be the projector, I think, because you, your voice is quite to project. Do you reckon? Yeah. Huh. Do you really need a mic? No. <laughs> We're going to have one mic up here. I'll project. Are you sure you're loud enough? Maybe. I'll try. I've got my Instagram on private, but my LinkedIn is very professional. But if I wanted to build up my Instagram, it might harm my LinkedIn. So how do you deal with a conflict of interest? Should you try and merge the two platforms to build the same brand? Or, yeah, like what's your advice with that? Well, I mean, I, I'm pretty active on both platforms. And if I posted what I post on Instagram on LinkedIn, it would not do my reputation any favors, <laughs> especially what happens in the stories. Mm. You know, look, I always tell people on LinkedIn, I was like, whatever's not professional enough to end up on LinkedIn, it goes on to Instagram. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know. I, 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 there are people that follow me on both channels, but they're like there for that reason. You know, um, 
I've taken a lot of risks with my brand, I think, on Instagram, but it hasn't really seemed to backfire at all. Instagram's more fun. And again, it's about what people expect. They expect it to be more social. On LinkedIn, it's more business. It is more professional. So a post that maybe on Instagram would be more fun, yeah, wouldn't be appropriate for LinkedIn at all. But I think you've got a pretty good gauge of one or the other. I, like I was named after Notorious B.I.G. on Instagram up until six weeks ago. It didn't work. He thought it was funny. No one got it. Oh. I didn't get it. <laughs> this is what I do. So we changed it. I said, when this tour goes around America, you've officially made it and you may change your Instagram username back to Bibi Smalls. Does that answer your question? Kind of, but I mean like, what could your Instagram ruin your LinkedIn perception? I don't think so. Unless you're posting like nude selfies on Instagram, like- With red bikinis on. With red bikinis, like he did. <laughs> it, it can't. As long as you can, I mean, you're clearly a smart girl. You know when to draw the line. You know what's appropriate and what's not. And you can be more fun on that platform because ultimately it's a more fun platform. But I don't think it's going to ruin your LinkedIn reputation. Yeah, I, the vibe I'm getting is like you need to take more risks with your brand, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, people will actually probably love it because that's why they follow you on Instagram. They want to get to know the fun social person behind the business profile. You know, that's that's us as human beings. We're curious. That's what we want. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, we'll go up the front here and then we'll go around to the back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jasmine. Yeah, it does actually. So my question sort of leads in from the previous question. Um, we've talked about the kind of content you could post on LinkedIn versus Instagram. Do you have some examples of brands or some uh, where you've worked directly where you've sort of had a domino effect by bouncing content off each other to amplify the content because it is on two mediums and not separate content? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's part of the reason why we showed you that stuff is because you can use the same content on both channels. Sometimes it just needs to be positioned a little bit differently. It's still ultimately like what we were saying at the start. On Instagram, you're leading with the image. On LinkedIn, you're leading with the words. That's right. Yeah. So that changes the content straight away anyway. Yeah, and you've got like to think about different sizes of video. We're getting technical now, but like obviously if like the size is like, you know, what's it, what do they call it? Landscape on LinkedIn and you put it in a story, it's not gonna look right. Like that, that sort of stuff you need to be mindful of. I use an app called InShot when I do that myself. InShot's a really good app to use to resize stuff. Um, but that's a part of like what we're doing to promote this tour. Like uh, half of you guys are from LinkedIn, half of you guys are from Instagram. You know, Brooke's been doing most of the activity on Instagram, I try and do what I can. Yeah. But um, You stick to LinkedIn. Yeah. But then he's getting heaps of bums on seats from LinkedIn. I'm not, but I'm getting them from Instagram. So we both know our platforms and we both know where our audiences are. And ultimately that's what it comes down to. What's your goal on each platform? You know, he's generating leads for LinkedIn. He's very, very good at it. But advertising that on Instagram might not necessarily get him the results that he wants, but it gives the brands uh, insight into who this person is and do they want to work with him or not yeah I've I found it's good for like collaborations I've a lot of the celebrity entrepreneurs that I've interviewed I've contacted through Instagram normally they have Instagram in their pocket they don't have LinkedIn normally somebody else managing their LinkedIn so that's been interesting but they're not necessarily clients um, and by the way guys the only reason we're doing LinkedIn versus Instagram we probably um, don't know if we made this 100% clear, but these are the two platforms at the moment that you can get organic reach on So free. not paid. Without paying for advert, we've grown our businesses without paying for advertising. Yeah. So you can, there's such phenomenal opportunity to get organic reach on these platforms. And that's why we don't think there's enough people focusing on them. So we want to run these, run this program, run this tour, so that you know exactly how to use these platforms to their maximum capability to get results because it's absolutely possible. When I, at the Social Media Marketing Awards, when they had the best use of LinkedIn category, like they're listing all of the finalists 
and each one of them has spent like millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars on a campaign, and it's me. I spent zero dollars, and I managed to win. Yeah, so like, it's proof. You can do that on LinkedIn at the moment, is you can get more organic reach than you can by sponsoring stuff. It's amazing. Uh, it won't last, it's not gonna last forever. You know, this is a public company we're talking about. The focus is to make money. Um, so advertising is gonna become more of a thing. But that's why you gotta do it now. You've got to get in now. Who wins on these platforms? The people that get in first. By the time all the other people have cottoned on to it, they're going to struggle to get ahead because who's going to be ahead? You're going to be ahead. Can't okay. beat first. Next question. Hi. Um, my question was, what's the best way to make a post trend on LinkedIn? Like a video versus photo, is this any difference or not? To make a post what, sorry? Uh, a post um, trend, like on LinkedIn, <clears throat> yeah. Like, you go viral, yeah, okay. Go, yeah. Uh, video is the best. Yeah? Yeah. So around three minutes long or like? The shorter, yeah. The shorter the better. So as short as possible, but short as possible when you're still getting the value across. If you can get the value across in 15 seconds, awesome. Right, and then most of it can be in the comment, on uh, the caption, I guess. The caption will make them watch the video. Yeah, like if you are, images do okay, but it needs to be more than just a photograph. Like that picture where that girl was going like, like that, like, you know, that's not gonna get much engagement on LinkedIn. But if you have like a quote on top of a picture, maybe just not with the fish face thing, you know what I mean? And our hashtag's quite important as well, would you say? Yeah. Not really? Okay. Not so much. It's, it's important from like a historical content perspective. So like if I want to see all of Brooke's content, I just go to her Instagram profile and there it is, right? Whereas on LinkedIn, you, you go to their profile, you, can't, you just see a CV, right? Like you don't see all of the historical content. So if you create your own hashtag, that's one way that people can find all of your historical content. So I have two, like I have Ask Nat, which is basically people asking me questions. A lot of these Q and A's that are being videoed at the moment will be Ask Nat episodes, Q and A, um, questions and answers. And then I've got LinkedIn Heroes as well. So all of these interviews that I, you know, where I interview entrepreneurs, if you click on that hashtag, you'll be able to find them all. And you can just sit there for hours on a Friday night watching them. <laughs> Yay, I know what I'm doing Friday night. <laughs> How you doing, man? I've known uh, Nathaniel for about six years, so it's been a while. Um, the, the main question I got is mainly for people in the room, not really for myself, but um, for people who are more introverted, right? Um, how would you advise them to be able to compete in such a noisy market, you know, especially amongst a lot of people who are extroverted? That's the first question. Great question. Well, <laughs> Brooks can be quiet on this one. <laughs> You introvert or an extrovert? I think I'm a tad extroverted. <laughs> cool. So just a tad. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Excellent. I, I think I have both qualities, but like I think that if you are introverted, um, it doesn't have to be video. Like it just, just doesn't have to be. No. It can be written content. It can be audio. You know, it could be. Images, like I don't know, there's a lot of Instagram creators that literally just take pictures of food and they're really good at it and they make a living off of that. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but on LinkedIn, like writing, if you're a good writer, just write articles. I mean, you know, you don't have to be video. And if it is video, like, I think that um, maybe it just helps to have a couple of shots of tequila first or something. <laughs> Whatever works for you. <laughs> but what ultimately builds up your confidence is when you start getting feedback. If you are creating and delivering valuable content that your customer enjoys and you're delivering it to the right person and they're enjoying consuming it, they want to tell you, they want to engage with you, they want to comment and say, oh my God, I just learned something or oh my God, this is incredible content. And it's when you start getting that feedback, that's what naturally starts to build up your confidence level. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, what's that word? When something goes like that. Exponential curve. Exponential. I'm yeah. not technical. It's exponential. <laughs> what will, will happen though at some point, because it's not all like positive feedback, right, is when you get popular, and it doesn't have to be that popular, but you get to a point where you start to get like, 
unconstructive feedback, you know, like from, so antisocial people are three times more likely to comment than somebody who's, who's not antisocial. So we call them like haters or trolls and people like will write you and say, hey, your voice is really annoying, you know? Yeah, people say that to me all the time. <laughs> I'm like, I know, why are you listening to me? <laughs> yeah, like, why don't you unfollow me, right? Totally, but they still consume my content because they know it's fucking good. <laughs> I heard that um, 2000 to two, to, sorry, 2020 to 2023 is like the main, like the last three years you really got to really make it in social media. Is that true? Before it gets real crazy? Well, like, it could be. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, everything's changing, right? It is a very much a changing landscape. Like people are consuming content differently. Attention spans are getting shorter. But at the end of the day, if these social media sites just become these advertising portals, who the hell is going to hang out on them? But it's not just that. It's ultimately every social media site runs, gets popular, grows by valuable content. Mm. So it doesn't matter what platform ends up evolving and what platform comes in. What matters if is you know your target market and you know what content they find valuable because then you just adapt it to the platforms as they come in. And that's, and, what matters. And that's why it's important to have a real relationship with yeah. your audience because all those guys on Instagram that like, I don't know, bought their followers or on LinkedIn, right? They use all these hacks like engagement pods and they like join these, these things and like everyone likes your content and you like the content back and they haven't got any audience like off of LinkedIn. That's not a real relationship. So if LinkedIn doesn't work tomorrow, they don't have an audience. It was yeah. never real in the first place. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I do invest time on Instagram and you know, the other platforms like YouTube that are out there. Because if one of them goes tomorrow, like I still have a relationship with, these, with this audience. We still have an email database. You know, we have, I'm trying to strengthen my offline relationships by doing events like this with you guys. Um, I think it's so powerful. If you have a deeper relationship with your audience, you know, you're gonna have more of an engaged community. How I, I wanted to create a international roadshow. Uh, and uh, like, I, I need uh, large audiences uh, in different parts of the world. So what would be the best, I've got about a lead time of six months. So what would be the best strategy combining LinkedIn and Instagram to, to get the audience? And so Anoop's got a um, digital agency. Correct? Yep. Um, LinkedIn has introduced an events portal in the last couple of months. It's so cool. Yeah. yeah. We found it extremely effective. So you can like literally invite people in your network to come to events. But in specific areas. Yeah, in specific areas. And so you can't do that on Facebook. That'd be a good place to start. But grow your network as well with the right people. Yeah. And, um, and then just follow up like to, to make sure that they're coming and stuff like that. I think that's quite important. Um, but that's my biggest tip, you? I mean, still delivering value. Work out who it is that you want to come to these events. Where are they? How can you connect with them? How can you start fostering that relationship so they're interested enough to come right, when yeah. you're in their city? Yeah, you should be posting content, training your audience that you deliver value yeah. before the event. Yeah. So would you, would you do actual DMs on Instagram with people and, and get them to come to your event? Um, like as in send them the ticket. So yeah, like besides doing the, con besides uh, churning out content and video and stuff like that, yeah. would you actually take people 101 and DM them and get them to the- If, they follow, if they're following you yeah. and they're interested in your content, yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah, yeah. sure. Thank you. Totally. Thanks. I'm launching my consultancy in the next few weeks as a jet lag consultant. Oh my God, I needed you. I slept for an hour last night. <laughs> I can, I can fix that. Just give me 10 minutes, I'll fix it for the rest of your life. Okay. Come on then. <laughs> and, you know, I've put up posts on LinkedIn for the last three or four years while I've been doing my PhD, which I finished, thank God. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> PhD in jet lag, that's the thing. <laughs> I have a PhD in Instagram, so I understand. Well done. <laughs> and, um, you know, I put up content, but the th thing that is catnip for my f my followers or whatever they are on Instagram, I put on a pair of jet lag goggles. All They're right. like these green lights. They look like I'm going to a rave. And Sexy. Uh, they just go through. <laughs> I like, I put a pair on at a conference a couple of weeks ago and I got 2,000 likes on that thing. How do I just, because I want to educate, 
but also I've got to take into account this weird factor in, you know, that jet lag goggles and um, random stuff kind of seems like another big post was airports I hate. You talked about yeah. negative. Um, hotel, you know, wish things that I wish American hotels would learn. Because it's entertaining. <laughs> yeah. That's entertaining that to your target market. I hadn't thought of it. But now you have. So think outside the box because that will ultimately start becoming your point of difference. Okay, so it's not just educational, it's entertaining and that's... Totally. Okay. Totally. I got that. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. You should have worn the goggles tonight. I would have put I them on I think that too. deserves a round of applause. Yeah, actually. well done. <laughs> I had a question on scalability of quality content. Now, obviously there's a lot of effort that goes into each one of these posts and one of the primary components is creating value and quality as a result of it. How do you, is there a way to scale that in a quality way so it's more efficient as a process? Question number one. And question number two is probably a lot of people have heard of Gary Vee and he just pushes content, content. I've got mixed feelings about that in terms of just pushing so much content can, you know, overwhelm your audience. You've got to be quality firstly. So for somebody who is perhaps starting out in their journey, uh, especially in content creation, well, what's your approach on how much content do you produce on a daily basis and does it incrementally increase as time goes on? Um, how does it all behave? So the two questions. Um, well, it ultimately depends still on your audience and what valuable content. So I'd be posting once a day. If you want to talk about streamlining it, if you can create a schedule so that every Monday you post about this topic, every Tuesday you do this topic, because that will ha help to sort of train your content brain. So you'll start seeing opportunities or a question will come up from a customer and you'll be like, oh, that's going to fit really well into my Wednesday topic. And it does start really helping you. You can also batch content. So you could sit down and record a whole I bunch of videos yes. I, in yeah. one day um, and, and have a content batching day or day of the month or day of the week. You've got to find what works well for your schedule. Hootsuite, have you? I mean, I've heard mixed reviews about it again. What's your thoughts on that? About what? Hootsuite. Oh, Hootsuite. Is, is that how you say it? Hootsuite as like a scheduling app. Yeah. yeah. Um, for Instagram, I personally like Plannerly for no other reason than the aesthetic. It's just black and white. It's super easy to use. It works on your desktop and it syncs to your phone as well. Um, but it only does Instagram. Hootsuite does them all. So you just want to make sure whatever scheduling app or planning app you find it is an Instagram partner. Yeah, so I mean, make sure it's an Insta yeah, partner. that's a good point. But, but eventually like these uh, social platforms, Ideally, they, they're, they're probably not going to want a third party tool like posting on them. Because like you know, Facebook, for example, you get less reach. LinkedIn, I don't really know. But eventually, like the algorithm will get smart enough so that it doesn't give third party tools as much reach. Um, and I think the, the question about like how often do you post? Like if we asked a different question and we said, well, how much value do you want to provide your audience? Yeah. Is there a limit on that? I mean, if every post is providing value, like what Gary Vee's idea of posting 100 times a day doesn't seem that crazy. Like, why wouldn't you? If every post is providing value, you know, if people don't engage with it, they're not going to see it. Um, so I think the question does become more of a quality question, like you said. It's like, well, am I detracting from the quality by posting more? In which case, maybe don't do it. I post five times a day. Every post, I think, is going to be valuable. I, I try to make it valuable. But it takes me a lot less time to post now than it used to because I've been doing it so long. Yeah. Like I know exactly what to write to get engagement because I've been practicing for so long. And you get faster and you do start putting on, I call them like content goggles. So you can <laughs> basically like I have my content goggles on all the time. You can pretty much give me anything now and I can turn it into valuable content that I know is going to convert into a customer because I've been doing this for so long. So it's just a matter of starting because the sooner you start, the better you'll get. So any scaling hacks? Would you do like a whole series of videos Literally, in a row? Literally, like every piece of content you do, you could probably like repurpose, start at a different point in the video, change the wording around. You yeah. could do it like 120 times, the same piece of content. Yeah. Totally. And if it's really good content that worked last month, archive it, share it again. And repetition is key because like, you know, people's attention span is so short, you want to be repeating the same stuff. Totally. It's the only way they... 
Like you're gonna be like, oh, I posted about that six months, I'm not gonna post about it again. No one can remember what you posted six months ago. You can use it, and on Instagram, I, I think it's okay. Like you can use the same photographs again after a few months, like why not? It's totally okay. Yeah. People are consuming so much content. You have their attention for the moment they're reading it and as soon as they scroll, they're onto something else. But that works in our favor because it means that we can talk about the same topics over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So I've got a question for Nathan, that is possible. Um, well, that oh, is right. just on LinkedIn. I'm posting sort of video content at the moment and I get lots of engagement where it's very long form engagement. So it's given me a sign, obviously, if people put in time into the messages onto the videos, there's some value there. So should I respond to those quickly at the end of the day? Because that's sort of kicking in for me now. So is there a smart time when to respond with all the algorithms and stuff like that? Really good question. That's fantastic. So when somebody takes the time to comment on your content, like no matter how long the comment is, like it amazes me when I look at people who've posted and they haven't even responded and said at least thank you for your comment. Like you need to put more value on someone that's taken the time to engage with your stuff so that they'll continue to engage with it. And if they've taken the time to literally like write, you know, 10 sentences, five sentences or whatever it is and share their thoughts, you really need to acknowledge what they've said and li like listen to what they've said. It's a bit like dating, right? You know, it's like you gotta acknowledge what they've said, listen to them and acknowledge the time and thought they put into it. What most people do is they, they read the comment and they're like, yeah, but I think this, and they share their thoughts. You know, and that's not really listening, you know, that, that wouldn't work in a dating environment, would it? Yeah. Is it, also, is it also speeds with the algorithm if I respond quickly or if I do it later? So is there a difference in studies, long comments come through? Yeah, quicker is better. Yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. It's ideal, but you've got to make it fit with your schedule. Yeah. We call that stuff community management. Yeah. I'm curious about, maybe more so LinkedIn, but Instagram might apply as well, about building the right audience. Because I do have a massive amount of connections through my, through my job and my history, but through my business that I'm running now, it's very specific in terms of the accommodation space. Um, I'm using groups to then be able to find people that might be like relevant to me. How do I go about actually finding those people without having to go down the organic path and just kind of shooting in the dark all the time? Uh, so literally use the advanced search feature on LinkedIn to search by job title, industry, location, and you can put these specific phrases when you use the advanced search tool, and then send them customized connection requests and say, hey, you know, I've noticed that you're in the combination industry or whatever it is, um, I'd love to connect with you. That's it. You don't like explain why or who you are or anything like that because they can always click on your name and read your profile. But then you're being proactive. See, a lot of people think that you build your network on LinkedIn by posting content and then you're going to get people that want to connect with you and you kind of sit there and you go, yeah, they're relevant, except they're not, reject, except, reject. That's a very reactive way of doing it. If you're being proactive, you're the one sending the connection requests. You know, like you could have 30,000 followers on LinkedIn, but if you've been reactive, if you built them by just accepting connection requests, my guess is it's probably a pretty crap network. Whereas if you're being proactive and they're all in your target audience, they're all the ideal client, that's huge. And, right? and so just in terms of scaling that, outsourcing it, any dangers of, of outsourcing? Oh, there's lots of dangers, yeah. <laughs> so you've got to have systems in place to make sure that nothing goes wrong if you're going to do that. It needs to be really well managed. You can't have people saying, no, I don't know this person all the time because you're going to get banned by LinkedIn. You know, I've never had a client banned by LinkedIn, but I have been banned seven times. So I know where the boundaries are, right? <laughs> you have to know where the boundaries are if you're going to outsource stuff. Um, I just wanted to go back quickly to the gentleman's uh, comment about like confidence and things like that for introverted people. Um, I'm a film director and uh, one big thing that I find is um, actually uh, making video content, but you don't necessarily have to post it all the time until you do feel confident. And another resource that I think is really underutilized is professional presenters. So in places like Melbourne, uh, for example, we've got a massive pool of up and coming people that want to uh, get their career off the ground. So that's something I think that people should consider if they're a little bit introverted um, with, with posting online. 100%, that's yeah. a great point. And, and also like, you can share with your audience like content that you enjoy, like go and interview people that you know, inspire you or that you think your audience will resonate with. 
and literally just share their thoughts with everyone and you are still the thought leader, like you're still the one bringing that content to them. It's a really powerful way to do it as an introvert. I've, I've got a huge amount out of my interview series. Like I literally don't even have a, I don't even have a mentor at the moment because I just get to interview all these like awesome people that I learn from. It's like having unlimited supply of mentors, right? <laughs> you go and interview them and it's like when you start to get traction, you'll, be, you'll find that most people will say yes because why? Most people want to talk about themselves, right? And one question as well, are you guys on TikTok? <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm not, but I, I'm, I'm TikToking it. I heard that you can make really good video on TikTok to use on Instagram. So that's where I'm going with it. Yes. So thanks for tonight, guys. Um, quick question, uh, more for everyone, just from an entertainment point of view. Was there one piece of content, like obviously you guys have been really, really successful with you know, your respective networks, but can you recall like one bit of content that you got to go viral and, and what was it about that bit of content that, that kind of helped you get to where you are today? Yeah, hundred um, percent. There's been a few. Yeah, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, oh, well, I don't need that. Um, something that I definitely remember that went bonkers is pointing out the eight biggest mistakes that people make on Instagram. Again, what we were saying before, if you can point out what people are doing wrong, that's valuable because they can take that and action it straight away. So for me, that was huge and it still continues to be huge. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a couple of big ones for me. One was when I first told that story about um, uh, being evicted and, you know, that sort of stuff. Like I told that story in a video the first time. I, I don't even know how we got onto that, but I ended up telling this story and it was obviously very vulnerable. I was, a bit, I was really nervous telling it and I watched it and I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to post that. But when I did, it went viral, like it was, yeah. it went bananas. And uh, I've posted it a couple of times since then, it always does well. Um, and then, you know, negatives, <laughs> well, not negative, but like calling out negativity has been a big one for me. So like a lot of people will post negative crap or start bagging people on LinkedIn. And I, I called that out, that went viral, 234,000 views, I think it was, something like that. That was crazy. But I mean, like these days, you know, viral content is, is cool, but it's, it's just one post. Like I'd prefer to get five posts out in a day, they all do okay, and you get the same amount of views at the end of the week, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If you can try and keep it consistent, that is the best. That's because ultimately that's going to ensure that every piece of content that you do deliver gets seen by the most people possible because the algorithm loves what you're sharing. And something that I want to talk about and, and stress as well on this whole consistency idea. So what we've still got to remember and bring it back to is that Instagram is a business. Okay, so I'm talking specific to Instagram now. Instagram is a business. Uh, the algorithm is what you rely on as content creators, which you all are, to share your content to as many people as possible. Instagram makes money by its users, us, seeing ads, right? So if I've got two businesses, two, two accounts, and I'm Instagram, and I'm the person that decides who sees what content, if I've got one account and I know that they post really valuable content every single day, their audience are really engaged, they're always coming and checking for their content, they're always watching their stories, then it's in my best interest as Instagram, as a business, to share that content to more people because more people are going to watch it and I'm gonna make more money from ads. Then I've got a business B over here that only shares content every now and again, sometimes takes a week off, disappears, then posts three times in a day, disappears for five days. They're inconsistent, they're not reliable. Why, as the algorithm, why would I share their content to more people when I'm trying to pick through all of the content creators on Instagram, why would I pick them? That's why consistency is key. Because Instagram looks at your account and essentially sees dollar signs. So if you can create that consistent content, Instagram's making money off you and essentially rewards you by increasing your reach. That's it, guys. I want to just take a moment to thank our sponsors. Uh, Jonathan Tanner is actually here today from the Social Media College. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Um, without our sponsors, this wouldn't be possible. Um, we've got Chris, who's done the photography tonight. A round of applause for Chris. 
and Garth on the video. Thanks very much.